Probability. Okay, so far we have been concerned about describing and summarizing samples or subsets of a population. Uh, we want to move on uh, from that. Uh, merely describing the results of a sample or what a sample looks like or uh, its central tendency or variability is nice, but um, we want to go further than that. And it's inferential statistics that allows us to go beyond our sample and draw conclusions about the population, draw educated guesses, make draw inferences, be able to say something from a sample about the larger group. Now, we need some help, though, from probability theory in order for inferential statistics to work. What that means is, is that most people view inferential statistics as, as descriptive statistics plus probability theory. So, um, as an introduction to inferential statistics, what we're going to be able to do following this, or what we, uh, what we, we talk about in the book, and what I'm going to talk about here, is um, or inferential statistics basically has two branches. One is called parameter estimation and the other is called hypothesis testing. Parameter estimation is basically that, is that is what we're, what's our best guess at a parameter. And remember a parameter is a quantitative characteristic of a population. So if we want to estimate a parameter, we want to estimate the population, uh, uh, the quantitative characteristic of a population, uh, parameter estimation will get you there. So in other words, let's say we wanted to get get best guess at mu, the population mean. Let's say we want to take a be our best guess at, at sigma, the population standard deviation. Well, it turns out the parameter estimation is pretty pretty straightforward, and that is that our best guess at mu is m. Our best guess at, at sigma is s. So parameter estimation is um, is just that. Is uh, We're going to do that. We can do, we can take parameter estimation a little bit further and do um, something called confidence intervals, but uh, I'm not going to spend any time on that. I'm going to move to the second more valuable uh, uh, feature of inferential statistics, and that is hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is when we state several mutually exclusive statements, or hypotheses, and we find the probability of obtaining our results assuming one of those statements is true. In a sense, we're putting together two competing uh, explanations of the world, or two competing hypotheses, and then we're going to determine which one uh, might be best. What we're actually determining, technically speaking, when we do hypothesis testing, and this is something to memorize, is that we're determining the probability of our results given the null hypothesis is true. So what is probability, probability theory and what's its role? Well, probability theory are better, we should say, probability theories are found in mathematics and are interested in questions about unpredictable events. For example, the chance of rain, the odds of rolling a five at the crafts table, the likelihood that a radioactive mass will emit a particle, the probability that a coin will come up heads on a fl upon flipping it, the probability of getting exactly two heads out of three flips of a coin, or the probability of getting two or more heads out of three flips. Notice that these three uh, options here are a star. They have a star, and that is that these are related these are related based on the probability associated with getting a heads on a single flip of a coin. So the probability's role is that we are going to talk about um, things now in probabilistic terms. What's the probability that um, uh, a particular therapeutic intervention will be successful? Uh, what's the probability that a drug will work for a particular thing? Those are the sorts of things that we want to answer in psychology. But uh, a, a slight regression here um, in terms of probability and what it is. Okay, so let's imagine just a jar full of marbles that are red, white, and black. Now, probability theory in its generic form makes statements about the likelihood of certain outcomes or events under certain known conditions. Probability makes statements, quantitative statements, on a scale of zero, from zero to one where zero means not going to happen and one means a sure thing. A probability of zero means it will not happen. A probability of one means it will happen. And probabilities in between, values in between, are more or less likely. They're, they're, they're relative values. Now most of us understand probability in terms of a relative frequency measure. Okay, Frequency divided by the number of trials or observations. 
Um, and we're going to assume that the frequentist position of probability is uh, works for us. That is, that relative frequency and probability are the same. However, probability theories are about the properties of probabilities, not whether they are true or not. And what that means is the determination of a probability can come from a variety of sources. What if we counted all the marbles in the jar and we find that we have 100 if we go back to this uh, marble example. Let's say we find 100 black marbles, 50 red and 50 white. And we calculate, we make a frequency distribution and a relative frequency distribution. It certainly seems like relative frequency looks like probability. What's the probability of getting a black marble if you were to reach your hand in there and pull out one? Most of us would say it was 0.5. If, we, if I ask you what's the probability of, of getting a white marble, you would probably say it was 0.25. That's the relative frequency of the, this particular uh, outcome, white. A graphical representation of a relative frequency distribution is also similar to what we call a probability distribution. It se certainly seems like relative frequency and probability are one and the same, and I'm going to suggest that they are. Now. What if we choose a single marble out of the jar? Well, if we choose a single marble, we say we have the probability of 0.5 of getting a black, 0.25 of getting a white, and 0.25 of getting a red. But what if we were to choose 200 marbles from the jar, tally the color, and replace them? Would we get 150 and 50? Exactly. What if we did that again? If so, what if we selected only 199? Which one would come up short? We think that 0.5 and 0.25 and 0.25 are the real probabilities in the long run. Okay, And what that means is that if we were to do this over and over and over and over again, that the relative frequencies would equal the real probabilities. This is Bernoulli's theorem. It's the notion of in the long run. And it's also known as the law of large numbers, and that is, as the number of times an experiment is performed approaches infinity, it becomes large. The true probability of any outcome equals the relative proportion. So, we know that, uh, we, we think that the true probability is its long-term relative frequency. Okay, so one of the things that I slip, slipped in here was that when we select numbers from the jar, we put them back. We say that every selection is independent, and that is the jar forgets what's been selected. What if the events, what if the selections are not independent? And in this case, we start to refer to something called the conditional probability of an event. The occurrence of one event is influenced by another event. And conditional probability refers to the probability of one event under the condition that the other event is known to have occurred. The probability of A given B has occurred is sometimes symbolized like this. Probability of A given B. So why does probability theory and, and have anything to do with hypothesis testing? So let me try to tell you a little story and try to illustrate how we're going to put these two together. A man comes up to you on the street and says that he has a special quarter that when flipped comes up heads more often than tails. And you figure, boy, I could maybe use this. This is a special quarter. I might get all my drinks paid for at the bar. All i got to do is challenge some guy to, I'll flip them, and, you know, whoever, you know, if it comes up heads, he buys, and if it comes up tails, I buy. You know, or something like that. I don't know. You know I'm making up stuff right now. But it's a, but it's a, 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 a loaded coin that you can buy from him for a dollar. Now you say that you want to test the coin before you buy it. And he says, okay, but you can flip it only five times because he's on the run, the cops are after him or something like that. How many heads would convince you that it was a special coin? You got five flips. Would three out of five? Would four out of five? Would five out of five? I mean, how sure do you want to be that this is a special coin? What is the chance that he's fooling you and selling you a regular quarter and making 75 cents on you? Okay, so basically we can talk about this situation in terms of two mutually exclusive statements about reality or two hypotheses. 
One is, is the coin is not biased. It's a normal quarter that you get at any bank. It's not a special coin. Okay? The likelihood of getting a heads on a, on a single flip is 0.5. We think that in the long term, if you flip this coin over and 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 over again, half of the flips will wind up as heads, half of them will wind up wind up as as tails. The probability of getting a head is the long-term relative frequency of heads. The second hypothesis is that the coin is special, and that is the probability of getting a heads on a single flip is greater than 0.5. Now let's assume that's a regular old quarter, and the probability is equal to 0.5. That is, the probability of getting heads on a single toss is 0.5. We flip the coin and get four heads. We can then ask the question, what is the probability of this result, assuming the coin is fair? Now note, the reason I mentioned conditional probability is that this is a conditional probability problem. What we're asking is, what is the probability of four out of five heads when the coin is fair? Because that's possible, right? If the coin is fair, what's the probability of getting four out of five? How do you solve this problem? So what ideas might you have about this solving this problem? You might think that the probability of four out of heads is the probability of the heads on the first trial times the probability of getting a heads on the second trial, times the probability of heads on the third trial, times the probability of heads on the fourth trial. And if you calculated that probability of 0.5 to the fourth power, 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, you'd wind up with a value of 0 0.0625. But you would be wrong. That's not a solution to this problem. Why not? Well, because you've just calculated the probability of getting exactly heads, 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 heads on the first four flips of your coin. Okay? Remember we flipped it five times and got exactly four. We got, we got four out of five. Now, <clears throat> I might ask then, what's the probability of getting heads, tails, heads, tails on four flips? Well, it's exactly the same as heads, 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 heads on any single, uh, on, 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 uh, um, on any single combination of four heads and tails are equally likely in this scenario, and here they are. Okay, Here's all the possibilities following the four flips of a coin. You can get all tails, you can get heads, tails, 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 you can get tails, heads, tails, tails, you can get tails, tails, heads, tails, you can get tails, 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 heads, you can also get tails, heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, and so on and so forth. Now, if you see, I've arranged this chart in a particular way. And that is that all of these, there's only, there, there's only this way in which we get, what's common about what's in this column is there are zero heads. What's common about this column is that there's one heads. What's common in this column is that there are two heads, three heads, and four heads. Okay, And there's exactly one way to get four tails out of four flips. There's four ways to get one heads out of four flips, there's six ways, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, this is a frequency distribution. And if we compute the relative frequency, we have a probability. That's what I've done here. This is the relative frequency distribution of those options, or those alternatives. Now, what if I figured out the total number of possible outcomes of this experiment, and I figured out the total number of outcomes that had four out of five heads? Now remember, this is when we're flipping the coin four times. We've actually flipped a coin five times and got four heads. So what if we figured out the frequency of four out of five out of the total number of outcomes? Could we do it then? How many, outcome, how many possible outcomes are there flipping five times? the coin five times. Well, you could get heads, heads, tails, tails, tails. You could get tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. You get heads, tails, heads, tails, heads. There's lots of them. Well, how many are exactly four out of five? Remember, five, we have five flips with four heads. One possibility is to get heads, 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 tails. That has four heads in it. Heads, 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 tails, heads has exactly four 
So if I flip it first and get a heads, and then flip it again and get a heads, and flip it again and get a heads, flip it again and get a tails, and then flip it again and get a heads, that means I got four heads out of five. All of these are possibilities of four that, that it, it result in exactly four heads out of five flips. Given five flips, here are all the possibilities of, of our experiment. There's one way in which you can get zero heads. There's one, two, three, four, five ways in which you can get one. There are ten ways in which you can get two, ten ways in which you can get three, five ways in which you can get four, and one way in which you can get five. And here are the relative uh, frequencies or what we think of as probability. Given a fair coin, given what we can say is given a fair coin there is a probability of 0.15625 that you will get four heads and there's a pro there's a you know this is essentially like a 3.1% probability or a 0 0.03 probability that you will get five heads even with a fair coin so if we think of at least four heads out of five we add the probability of 4 plus the probability of 5 to arrive at an 18.75% chance. Upon flipping a fair coin five times, you will get at least four heads. So we are putting a value on that result. You have an 18.75% chance that this is a simple old coin. Okay? This is a simple, that there's an 18.5% chance that you would get that result or better if it were a fair coin. Okay. Now, you might not want to buy that quarter after five flips, but what if you were able to flip it a hundred times? You know, or how many times do you want to flip it? And uh, the reason I ask this question is sort of rhetorical, and that is because the more, the better, right? The more chances you have to evaluate that coin, the better, the closer you're going to become to uh, making a, a good decision about whether you purchase that coin or not. I know that's a silly example, but uh, that demonstrates or illustrates the issue of in the long run. The binomial probability distribution describes this situation. The probability of attaining k successes out of n trials is equal to p, uh, is equal to this, this particular function down here. The probability of k is equal to n grab k, p to the k times q to the n minus k. What are these things? p to the k is k is the number of successes. So what we asked was, what's the probability of obtaining four heads out of five trials? And what we did was we took 0.5, and I took that to the fourth power, and then took q, which is the probability of a failure on a success on, on a single trial, and took that to the n minus k power, and I determined that those probabilities. So the probability of 4 was determined using this, the probability of 5, the probability of 0, and so on and so forth. Um, this is the binomial probability function. We can instantiate this. We can put this in, in Excel in a couple of different ways, and that's what we're going to be doing in the lab unit, is using the binomial probability distribution to make decisions about things. All right. That's it for Introduction to Probability and Inferential Statistics. We're going to start drawing inferences uh, using the binomial distribution in the, in the lab. So uh, I will be back with a video on, on the board uh, about how we do that. Um, look for that in the next couple of days. See you soon.